Go. Mad Tech Industries, the official Cerakoter for Therapy Range. What is up, everybody? I want to make sure you go down to the description and below and hit the Gun Deals link. GunDeals.com is an affiliate group, affiliate link of mine, that brings all of the best deals on the internet together under one roof. And every time you click that link, Therapy Range gets a 30 cent kickback for that. So, mucho gracias if you go out and do some window shopping. Check out all the awesome deals. I just seen that they had 2,000 rounds of Aguila 22 LR for 100 bucks listed on this site. They've got Franklin Armory binary triggers for $179. It's unheard of. That's better than half price. If you support Chat Therapy Range, be sure to go check out all of the links down there, but especially hit that gun deals link because it helps the channel. We can do this, but we can only do this together, guys. Tonight, I've got a very special guest going to come on this show with me. We have Charles Tassel. He's running for Congress in Southern Ohio. I believe it's District 2 that he's, uh, that, he's, uh, that he's running for. There's a whole group of people, a whole bunch of people that are bidding for this job. And, uh, you know, Therapy Range thought, why not open up our network, our, our network of great American conservatives, you know, some of which do live in Ohio. But let's, uh, let's open up the platform for this fellow. And uh, let's hear what he has to say about a number of different issues. I'm going to bring him on now. His name's Charles. He lives here in Southern Ohio. He actually, he's not far up the road from me. So if you get elected, Charles, and you turn into a rhino, <clears throat> you're not that far away, buddy. <laughs> Without any further ado, Charles Tassel. Oh, I love it, Paul. I, I should have worn my rhino hunter hat. I actually have a little hat with a target of a rhino on it. So I'm, I'm with you on that. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with Therapy Range and all of you, all of your supporters worldwide. So. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself, man. I'm going to give you a few minutes to, to do sure. your, your standard political intro, and then we'll get into the meat and potatoes of it because time is money. And, uh, you know, just like yourself, we all have time on our hands that we need to get compensated for. So we won't waste a whole lot of it here today. If it's possible, I'd like to keep the interview to around an hour, hour and a half. That way we can get on with our days. So let's get after it. Sounds good. I appreciate it. So I'll start off and say a couple of the basics. Uh, married for 31 years. I've got three kids. Uh, oldest is 25. Just got married in December. Two girls that are 21, 15. Uh, actually, the 15-year-old, the just Paul, she just reminded me that March 19th is the primary election date. March 20th, she actually gets her temps. So <laughs> it's like straight back to stress at that point. But well, so a couple of things. I, I'm, I'm running in the second district. I've been a councilman in the city of Deer Park for eight years. Stepped down from that. We moved from Deer Park to Claremont uh, back in 2000. And I've worked in um, a variety of tasks. I've been involved with young Republicans. I've represented the Greater Cincinnati Northern Kentucky Apartment Association for about 20 years. And then I'm chief operating officer for the National Real Estate Investor Association presently. We have about 40,000 uh, small business owners across the country and then involved with a number of 501c3s. I'm sure we'll get into those a little bit. Everything from Street Rescue to uh, Tassel Foundation for Civic Engagement, where we give scholarships to uh, high school students and high school seniors and work on a variety of different organizations, work with a variety of different organizations, including like Citizens for Community Values and a variety of other ones. Um, but the focus of what I'm really on for running is two things. One is budgets, two is borders. Uh, on the budget side of things, I see if I can share this here a little bit. This is a $10 billion bill. And I share this to say, this is what happens if you don't have fiscal responsibility. If you're going to spend yourself into oblivion, and in the last two and a half years, we've spent an additional $6 trillion that we just printed. And that's a problem because when you put that into a fractionalized banking system, that's $60 trillion that just diluted our money. And when you go back to look at what the dollar was worth in 1911 compared to what it's worth now, it's only three cents on what that 1911 dollar was worth. So just bear that in mind how much when we start talking about inflation and the value of something, that's what we are doing. Um, the advantage that we have, if you'll forgive me for being a little crude here, it's we're the cream of the crap. That's simple as I can put it, because 
everybody else is spending faster and worse than we are. So that's our saving grace right now is that we are not going downhill as fast as everybody else. If we don't stop and start to change this around, we will be continuing down that grade. And it's at some point, there's a tipping point that becomes too much. And some people suggest we may be there already. I would hope not. Um, I'm a little bit old school, kind of Newt, Ging Newt Gingrich style. I like to look in terms of block grants, shut down some of these departments, shift it back to the states. There's a little thing called the 10th Amendment we should be abiding by. The feds do not need to be doing everything. Uh, we need to shift it back to the states and get the feds out of it. Um, I'm a firm believer in Reagan's statement about, you know, the nine most uh, scary words in the English language or I'm from the federal government and I'm here to help. Um, so I think we need to bear that in mind as kind of a principle going forward on what we're going to do with the federal government. On the border side of it, Paul, there's there are a number of things we can talk about. We could spend an hour just on that issue alone. Oh, dude, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> it's, it's look, let me let me sum it up this way. We've got to fix both the wall and the gate. And by wall, I don't just mean, oh, let's put some concrete and steel up. Yes, that's a piece of it. There's a whole lot more that goes into it. But you can also do things like engage ICE so that ICE actually comes after folks who've been arrested and starts getting them out. And by the way, once they're out, you don't ever let them back in because you've actually got a wall in place. But let me also say, we need to make sure that we've got a gate that actually is functional because we've got people that would rather risk going to coyotes and cartels than try to come in through our front gate because it is so problematic. Um, we've turned it over to bureaucracies and, and that's a problem as well. So we are a country of legal immigrants and that's where we should be. And we've, we've benefited from that because we get not only the best and brightest, but we get the ones who are actually driven and want to grow. And that's what we need to continue to do. But we also need to make sure that we're stopping, I mean, 20 plus thousand Chinese young military age males crossing in just the last year. That's an invasion. And plain and simple, we need to call it that. So these are the kinds of things I think we need to stop and just focus on. And a lot of this is executive orders that were done as soon as President Biden and his administration came into office, and we need to change that. Um, those things can be fixed and addressed as simply as stroke of a pen, start enforcing it, uh, stay in Mexico, you don't come into country until you've come through our process, and then work through it from there. So those are a couple of the key pieces, and I'm happy to go into um, more of the issues, And but let's, let's start there with budgets and borders and other issues from, from there. Well, I couldn't agree with you more on your border stance on that. You know, everybody screams, we need a wall, we need a wall, we need a wall. I don't necessarily think that we need a wall. Maybe maybe in some specific locations, it would be beneficial to deter. But what we need is policy in place that deters these people from ever leaving their, their home countries. Correct. They need to understand that you're not going to just walk in. There's not going to be no debit cards for you. There's not going to be no asylum. You're going to get turned around and you're going to have to make that 1500 mile trek back to your home country, broke and hungry. Here's a bottle of water and a ham sandwich. Bye bye now. Yep. You know, we're not monsters. I got lunch for you. You may, you walked a long way. I'll give you a ham sandwich and a bottle of water. But you're turning around and you're heading right back. And if that means that we have to put someone on the American border every hundred feet with a rifle and a box of handcuffs, well, then that's what we got to do. But I think we can avoid that by just simply creating better policy. Well, and, and Paul, your point, one of the, the I, I call it the myths that's out there. People are like, oh, well, you're going to try to deport 20 million people or something. It's like, OK, let's let's go back to eight million as a number. They're still not trying to, you don't need to deport them. You change the policy so that there's not support here for them. And they realize that, you know what, because there are people who actually do want to move here and come in legally and legitimately, but you make it so that they have to actually go outside the country in order to come in legally, they will start moving and going outside the country. Because right now what we're creating is um, fentanyl carriers, drug mules, plus we get all kinds of human trafficking that come through. The cartels are making a bloody fortune off of all of this because we've created policies that allow for it. And and let's face it, we're not far from, you know, the first case of measles just popped up recently around our area here. That's because we have illegal immigrants who are coming in who haven't taken any of these kind of precautions. We don't know how diseased or sick they are. 
And even if they do get hurt, when what I mean by that is some of them will work, they'll get cash under the table, and there's a criminal element that will know that they've got they've got cash on them. And the literally the language for it on the term for it on the street is it's a Mexican ATM. And these are not necessarily Mexicans. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that they are. In fact, actually, the Mexican army the other day was yelling at our border patrol. These aren't Mexicans. They're Guatemalans. It's OK. <laughs> no, it's not. That, that, that was their idea of helping. It's like, are you kidding me? And one of the things like you like you brought touched on is that people are willing to go to a mule and risk rape, death, worse, yes. to be able to get into America because the, the system of entry to do it the lawful way is so convoluted and full of red tape. We actually have a guy watching in the live chat right now. He's riding, listening, listening along. He's in a tractor on his farm right now in Texas. Mm. And, uh, you know, he was born in Ireland. He moved to the United States just signed up and joined the United States Army and served in the United States Army. And uh, he did not get his citizenship through service due to the fact that the military required him to denounce his home citizenship in order to receive citizenship through service through the military. Mm -hmm. At least at that time, that's how it was set up. And he said, I don't want to denounce my citizenship. I don't come from a third world shithole. I just want to be a part of America because America kicks ass and, and I'd like to be a part of America. Well, it's been, I, I forget how many years and he's watching. I'm sure he'll tell me, but it, it's been since uh, like 1988, I think, or 1998 that he's been fighting the, the process to become a legal sovereign citizen of the United States. It's just here recently within the last three weeks that he got notified that he would be accepted into being able to take the classes and, and to go through the process to become a legal American citizen after a lifetime of service to the American military as a taxpayer to the American public. Um, he, he's worked a farm. He, he does what he's supposed to do. He, he abides by the laws. In fact, I've been a part of several live streams with this specific individual, and he will make most Americans feel stupid about not knowing what they should know. Like when we were talking backstage about how we could ask 100 people and most of them wouldn't know who the founding fathers are. If he was in that crowd of 100 people, that, would, that wouldn't come up. Right. Because he knows, I mean, he's, he, he took the time because he wanted to be a part of America so badly that he took the time to learn what being an American was about. Now, that doesn't mean that he had to give up his home culture or his home, shouldn't have had to give up his home citizenship. Right. And I believe when this is all complete, he'll end up with dual citizenship once it's all said and done. But it took the better part of a lifetime to get this process through for a guy that is a legitimate, hardworking person that wants to contribute. Whereas uh, these cats from other countries, all they got to do is walk across the border. Here's an ID. Here's a, 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 a bank card. Here's, here's a bus here. ticket. Here's a voucher for whatever you need that will be able to wash your ass and, and, and get your toiletries. And, you know, it, it's, it's really a punch in the balls to all of the Americans uh, that have migrated here and did things the right way. It's, mm -hmm. it's really discouraging and demoralizing. Why can't we fix that as a, as a member of Congress, if you was to get elected, what would be your game plan to go in and work on getting this streamlined? Now I understand you're just one Congressman. There's still a big field of fish out there, but you know, I mean, if you give every, give the right guys, the right hand jobs, you know, we might be able to make something happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Not going there, but yes. No, it, <laughs> but, but but your point, and I, I I usually say it this way: God gave us two ears and one mouth to use in proportion. You've got to sit down and talk to people, and, and not create straw men to go out and argue against, and then you know bash them on the news, bash them on your own, you know whatever TikTok thing you do, and then come in the next day. Hey, Paul, let's sit down and talk. Are you going to talk to me at that point? You know. If I make a, a literally a caricature of you, destroy the caricature and then say, hey, let's let's talk. Oh, he won't talk with me. See, this guy won't work. It's like that. We, we've got to be level headed. We've got to bring some of this to the table and really sit down and work. And um, I, I summed it up this way when I was talking with the leadership. I said, look, there's show horses and workhorses. Sorry, I'm a bit of a policy geek. I'll be a workhorse, not a show horse. I don't need to be out front. 
Um, so I, I, you sit down and work on the policies, and that means taking and it. And it is not easy when you're taking 60, 100, 200 page documents. And again, you know that that's the beginning of the document, not the end. Right. That's the it, intro. That's right. But you get the concepts down and you start working through the process of what this concept looks like. And then you again, back and forth with the attorneys who draft it and then come back to it. That's what it takes to really do this. And that you, then you build a consensus and you build a caucus based around that. That's what it's going to take. And it's not quick. It's not easy. I know people like to always have what's the quick, easy answer. There isn't one. Politics is difficult because of the details friend of mine said that one time and I, I he was spot on right because it takes the time to go through those details and we've got to work through it. Well, it would be different if everybody would agree on it. You know, if all Americans would come together and say, yes, close the border, we need this to happen. Well, it would be a slam dunk because you could get all this stuff done easy, quick. Everybody would agree. Nobody's going to haggle over this detail or that detail, but that's just not the world that we live in. There's always, I don't care how well you write this bill. It took our founding fathers months yes. to come to an agreement on our founding documents. That's you know, right. that's not something that happened like, oh yeah, this all just looks great. You know, just take out that thing about slavery and we'll all sign it. No, that that's not how it worked at all. I, I think you're spot on on that. I mean, so I, I mentioned budgets and I didn't say a budget, budgets. And the reason is there's actually 12 budgets we're supposed to be passing from the house over to the Senate and go from there. And those, if you remember, the reason that the president used to come and do the State of the Union in January was that kicked off. He launched, here's my budget ideas. And then the House was supposed to work on it. And by September, they're supposed to pass it. Now, that hasn't happened in about 15, 18 years because everybody kind of kicks the can down the road. And we end up saying, rather than going through and doing a, a complete budget review, we just take this continuing resolution CR and just keep kicking it down the road, add a few percentage points on, maybe add a few points here or there and just keep kicking it down the road. That's part of the problem because rather than doing the work, people are kicking the can and that's, I'm happy to come in and do the work. That's what I'd like to do. I'm, I've been an elder at my church for what, 15 years now and servant leadership is the role. And that's what we call it because, you know, Jesus came in to wash the feet not to lord over them, but to actually serve under them. And that takes work. And if we're not willing to do that, we have, there's no business, you have no business being in leadership. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. What do you think about term limits? If you were, a, if you were a elected to be congressman, where do you stand on term limits? Is that something that you see as something viable that we could actually make happen? Or is that just a pipe dream from the, the conservatives around the country? Is there, there any reality that could possibly come from talking about term limits on a professional level? Well, there's, there's a couple levels to that answer. So let's unpack it a little bit. Um, one, I, I signed on to supporting the term limits in place and moving something forward. And part of what that is, 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 is kind of a stage, stage, or a stage holder to say, look, this is something we need to consider. And as we build a caucus that's large enough to say, I think we need to actually move this forward once we've got enough. To, and let me back up for a second. We talked about this earlier, Paul. What does it take to actually pass something? I know when I was on council, if there's seven of us, I have to count to four. If I can't count to four, I'm not passing anything. So when you're putting that caucus together, are you going to get to a majority, whether it's the 215, 216, 218, depending on how many congressmen are actually in at any one given point? Ideally, you want broader participation, but that's the core of it. So what the term limit side is doing is really trying to build that core base to start having that conversation of general consensus. Yes, we need something done. And I'll give you a perspective on that. I started doing um, as a lobbyist working in the state of Ohio, representing people who owned real estate and trying to defend their rights from overreach for the government time and time again. Um, I actually dealt with this issue because I watched term limits kick into place in Ohio. And what I watched happen was legislators who'd been in office 10, 20, 25 years, we all go, oh, that's too long. At the same time, when they left, we lost a lot of institutional knowledge. When they left and we started getting new folks in, what happened was 
the power moved to the bureaucrats who were unelected and to the lobbyists who came in and would help them get newly elected. And it was one of those things where it's like they, they allow for two four-year terms or four two-year terms. So that's the House, is t- four two-year terms. The Senate is two four-year terms. And what we see is a lot of times, you'll, and I'm sure you've seen this, people move from the House to the Senate, kind of extend their time out. But what's interesting is most legislators, when they come in in their first two years, are really trying to figure out where the bathroom is. How do I do this? How do I not screw up and, and get their feet under them? And it's really in their second term where they start to go, okay, I can, I've got some, some chops now. I'm starting to understand this. And they start asking the questions. And by their third and fourth year, they start getting into these questions and going, okay, well, well, Director Paul, you gave me this information, but this is not what I asked for. Can you get me this report? And, and they start digging in deeper. And if they push too hard on these bureaucrats or the lobbyists, what happens is there's a there's a pushback on the bureaucrats will go, I'll just wait them out. Oh, your report? Yeah, we haven't gotten that done yet. No, it's it's coming. If you make it back the next term, maybe you can see that report. In the meantime, whatever lobbyist is going out recruiting somebody to run against them, and then they've got stress. And they're like, well, maybe I better not focus on this issue too much. That's a problem. That's that's where I see because they're now looking at, okay, I'm in my third term man, I've only got two more years. I got to start figuring out where I'm going next. And and so I'm not sure that that eight year time frame is necessarily the best way to do it. Because once you're in as in your fourth term, you're lame duck. You're not running again. And we often, you know, the psychologists think, oh, well, they're able to do what they need to do. No, they're looking for their own place to go someplace else. And that's a problem. Um, we get a few folks who do and they go into the end of it and they end, finish their term well. Most of them are looking for someplace else to go. So rather than an eight-year term, I think maybe 12 is probably about sufficient. Um, and that's kind of where I would look at it from, from experience that I've seen. Doesn't mean I'm set in stone on that, but that's from a policy perspective. What I've seen and giving power over to unelected bureaucrats, that is not where we want it. We want the power to be in the elected official so that we can call them to count at any kind of election. Fair enough. What would you? Uh, what would your approach be to dealing with the ever-growing crime problem that's that's growing here in America? And I'm not talking about necessarily just generalized crime in in mm-hmm. general, but more along the line of, of the crime that's being generated due to the open border policy. You know, we're seeing an influx of violent crime in all of your major cities that have deemed deemed themselves as sanctuaries. And uh, I'm, I'm seeing it on the media every day. They're crying and whining and complaining like, oh, this, this is a bad thing. This is a this is a very bad problem that we have here in our city right now. But we really we're not we're totally not going to do anything about it besides complain to the government and tell them we need more money. Give us more money so we could take care of our homeless problem of migrants. They won't stop robbing people. There's not a live chicken from freaking Brownsville, Texas to, to all the way up to McAllen. They yeah. eat every live chicken along the border. I made jokes about that in a stream back last year when uh, when this border problem really started exploding. Uh, like, could you imagine being a farmhand farmer along the border? Like you just your livestock is is on the menu, man. There, there's nothing you can do. Every day you come out, you're five or 10 head of whatever shorter than what you were the day before. I've even heard stories about the ranchers going out and putting ladders over the fences so they would quit cutting the fences and letting their livestock run loose. Here, use the ladder. They'll put a cooler of water bottles there by the ladder so when they come over their fence, they can get them some fresh water and keep on their trip. Please just stop cutting the damn fences. Yep. Yep. No, I I get it. And and, then... You know, that's where I mentioned earlier about the criminal element even coming after the, the Mexican ATM and they find people who are not banked. They don't have IDs, so they can't get a bank. They can't get a bank account um, and they have cash on them. So the criminal element will go after them. Well, that's crime. And we're building more crime and infesting more crime. And, OK, sometimes they show up in hospitals. Sometimes they don't. Now you've got from everything from festering wounds to infections to disease that run rampant all in the underbelly and it's continuing to grow. I've talked to prosecutors across the district on this issue alone 
and they're struggling with it. And if they call ICE, they get no response. You know, there's there's no getting out the, the, the really bad elements. But we've still got this ever growing increase. And I'm glad you brought up the sanctuary city thing, because that's one of those things that just drives me crazy. They get a bus load, one bus load, and they're going nuts like, oh, this is horrible. What do you think Texas is dealing with? What do you, I mean, they're dealing with literally we watch the we can watch it on the news. You can watch it on video cameras that are down there of thousands of people walking across every single day. And then, you know, the Border Patrol's dead. They're going, hey, see you. Goodbye. See you. Welcome to Walmart. You know, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. Here's your gift card. That's it. Go that way to get whatever you need. It's just, that's where. That's why I say, man, here's a bottle of water and a ham sandwich and a boot in the ass. You're headed back to wherever you're coming from. Correct. I'm sorry. Hashtag not sorry. You know, do I feel bad that you came all this way for no reason? Sure. Do I care enough to do anything about it? But, but bye bye now. Yeah, but the thing we can do is one is make sure they're not getting in because when they come in, and let's face it, whether it's the drug side of things and the fentanyl. Okay, and let's address this: precursors coming from China into Mexico, being made, and then drop drug across the U.S. and they're drug across the border and they get sent out everywhere. There are backpacks, there are videos of backpack after backpack of this stuff coming through, and especially with fentanyl, it doesn't take that much to come through and it can be extremely potent and extremely deadly. And there's my understanding is there's even some additional new drugs that are coming across. They're even more potent than fentanyl. And the potency aspect means that they can dilute it more so that it's more concentrated so they can pack it in smaller places and get fewer people to carry it across. Those are the kinds of things we've got to make sure we're stopping. Aside from the fact that now you've got this underbelly that gets abused, gets controlled for work, or sex, or whatever. That's all problems that we've got to stop. So I wandered off your question a little bit there, Paul. <laughs> That's all right. One of our uh, live viewers is uh, Enforcer34758 says, uh, no more dual allegiance, single page bills with no ability to add port, get rid of division by eliminating the two-party system. I, I wanted to address that real quick because, I mean... We have to keep things in, a, in the realm of reality, okay? I mean, mm -hmm. I understand there's a world in which you would like to see, but then <laughs> there's the world in which that we actually live in. And single-page bills that you can't add pork to, it, it's a pipe dream. You know, that, that's kind of why I asked the question about term limits. The way that I ask it, is it a realistic goal or is it just a pipe dream? And, and realistically, asking people to vote themselves out of a job probably a pipe dream. You know, I mean, I just really, it's been a topic of discussion for many years. This is not new. It's, it's not a revolutionary idea. This has been going on for a very long time. And if it was, if there was a real reality of voting in term limits to, to actually do that, I'm pretty certain somebody would have gotten that through by now. Now I'm not saying that we should stop giving up on, or we should give up on it, but it's, it's just not really a very realistic idea, like getting through single page bills. I mean, unless it's to, to declare war, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Let, let me address that, the single page bill thing, because I, I'll give you some examples. We worked on a 16 page bill, which was one issue on driver's licenses and getting them back to people who couldn't afford to work through their. I mean, let's face it, you need a car to get to work. And if you don't have a driver's license. You know, like getting that next level of success. Well, it, it creates a cycle of crime that that's it really it's not fair because, hey, I've got to go to work to pay my fines and restitution. But you're not allowing me to go to work because I can't travel. That's exactly. not fair. You're setting me up to get a driving under suspension. You're, you're setting me up for failure. And, and so how do we put pathways to success in place? And, and, and Paul, that was a bill that, by the way worked with both the NAACP and the Tea Party, both endorsed it, both supported it, and both said, please don't make me get on stage with the other one. <laughs> you know, they were like, yeah. But but it was a bill that passed. And then we came forward and they said they came back and talked to me and said, can we do you got anything else like that? What else you got? So we looked at it and said, okay, driver's license is an example. Um, this issue of 
how do you lose a driver's license? And during the process in the last bill, we'd heard that there were 40 different laws in the state of Ohio that would make you lose your, your driver's license. Well, as we got into it and dug into it, we actually found 66 laws and we broke them into three different phases. One is um, actually not related to lose, to driving at all, tangentially related to driving. So maybe you have something in your vehicle versus reckless driving or drunk driving that are you, you did this while you were driving or you drove into somebody. So, okay, let's separate these out. And we found that there's a few of them, including, you know, lack of, if you don't do your child care support, you can lose your driver's license. Now, that was a hammer that the legislatures across the country started using kind of in their early 2000s. I'm a victim of it. I, and, and this is one of those things like, does this really work or not? And the fact is, it doesn't you end up creating poverty, putting roadblocks in the way of folks. So we put this bill together. If you look at Ohio in Ohio, SB 37, it's a Senate bill. And it's uh, what it does. It's 166 pages. And it's only focused on this one issue of saying, how do we correct the current law to remove anything that's not directly related or ta even tangentially related to driving so that you don't lose a driver's license for all this other nonsense? And I say that say that's 166 pages on a single purpose. You can't do that in one page. So, well, I mean, I'm reading, I'm reading enforcers' comments over here, and and mm -hmm. I, I don't disagree with the sentiment of his statements. I, that's what the way it should be. It should be way less complicated. It should be way easier to get things done. But that's just simply not the world that we live in. And I don't see anybody rushing out to make the the radical changes that would be necessary. I mean, and, and it confuses me because a lot of Americans are under this impression that if, if we was to restart the government and, and put in all new people, that the problems would be different, yeah, that these right. that these problems wouldn't reoccur, that there wouldn't be no more dark money. There would be no more lobbyists, that there would be no more outside influences. There would be no more backroom leverages. They would be. No more, I'll scratch your back. My, sh I mean, that shit would all just start right over again. As soon as they figured out how to get a hold of the bags of money, it would start right over again. It, it's just, there's real world, and then there's the one that I wish it was. I wish it was this world, but that's not it, guys. You well, know, and, and, I, I understand your feelings on this. So, but the, one of those things is also be careful what you wish for. And this is part of the problem I see with Congress presently is they are so willing to draft a general piece of the bill and then kick it over the departments and let the regulators finish out the bill. And that to me is one of the worst things because now you've just given this whole department and literally generations of regulations following on whatever the quote unquote initial intent of Congress was. We see that with suppressors, bump stocks, all of these kind of things where bureaucrats unelected say, oh, well, you know what? I'm going to write this regulation in here and we're just going to pass this along and roll it out. That's exactly what we don't want. We want Congress to make sure that they approve those details and then bring it out. And Calvin Robinson left a comment. The, the very existence of lobbyists is proof that our elected officials votes are for sale. <laughs> But so let, let me push back on that a little bit. And, and I say that have from teaching grassroots side of things on lobbying, it, a lobbyist should, and I'll say it that way, uh, not that there are not corrupt ones, just like there are corrupt, name the industry, whatever. But, and, and I could have sold out many, many years ago and made a lot more money, <laughs> put it that way. But from a lobbying perspective, a lobbyist is there to represent your interest and connect you with folks. I had a, a friend of mine with Duke Energy, and he made a comment. He said, I don't know anything, but I know who. So when you have an issue, I can get you connected with the right people. And that's really what a good lobbyist should do. And if you do have a lobbyist, I'll also off offer this. They should never be meeting with your legislators without you. So if you're part of a group, pick the group, whether it's NRA, Buckeye, um, life issues or whatever, the lobbyist helps you get into the right person because they know the, that the, the makeup of that legislature. 
you go in and help bring across the issues, but they get you to the right person. Mm. My audience doesn't like the lobbyist concept very much. <laughs> I'm sitting here reading the live chat. They're, they're not a big fan of lobbyists. I understand. <laughs> well, and then there's, you know, in, in some of these statements, there could, could possibly be some emotion involved in the statements that are being made because let's face it the guy in the white house has got a lot of people emotional right now you know we're, we're if you're a conservative especially if you're a fiscal conservative holy crap are you upset with this guy you are not happy with the way this dude is running the show because there's nothing fiscally conservative about this guy there's nothing morally conservative about this guy as a matter of fact he doesn't even have a problem pooping in public I guess say the the, the, competency, the the competency level. Um, so Friday last week, I actually called for the vice president and the cabinet to do their duty to the country and start the process of Article Twenty Five, Section Four, which is he needs to be removed from office because. Why did not end up with Camel Toe Harris? <sighs> Does is that better? Well, let's okay. There's an election. <laughs> We'll deal with that. I'm not saying it's better by any stretch, but there's a process in place because here's the thing. The, we have the horns of a dilemma here. Either either he's competent enough to be charged oh, it's or he's so not bad. competent enough and he needs to be stepped down. That's as blunt as it gets. Orange man bad. Grandpa oh. Biden just crazy. Yeah. Get out of here with yeah. this nonsense, man. <laughs> That's that's some R-rated vocabulary coming if I've ever heard some. I'll keep it friendly tonight. We're trying to okay. make sure that everybody can watch this show. I'll, I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep my vo vocab <laughs> on the DL tonight because uh, you know the last time I got too crazy talking about JB, the Secret Service came out. Nope, oh, nope, oh, don't do that. Don't do that. Yep. Oh, dude, about six months ago, we were doing a podcast with a bunch of uh, other conservative guys, mm -hmm. and I made a comment about how I thought it would be hilarious if somebody, not me, but if somebody was to just open hand slap the big guy. <laughs> two, day, two days later, the U.S. Secret <laughs> Service was at my house asking me how serious I was about that. Yeah. I shit you not, tax dollars hard at work. Oh, man. But you know you're it, being – that tells you how broad your participation, your audience is right there. That's – Oh, dude, I we I made a video out of it. It's oh, on yeah. my channel. I, I, my, I, I had I, my I, wife I, video record the whole thing, and I put, put it all together and put out a video mocking them because they came all the way to my house, and they were asking me questions like, how long have your parents been deceased? How long have you lived here? How many children do you have? What do you do for a living? I mean, they came out here and asked me like 15 public information questions. Like yeah. you didn't look at my Facebook. You didn't. Yeah. Hindsight's looking back at it. I have educated myself in, the, in their tactics of trying to get information out of people. And I realized that during the interview, they actually only asked me two questions that they gave a rat's ass about. Hmm. One question is, there, are there any firearms in the house? The second question is, are you a member or affiliated with any right wing extremist groups? Those were the only two questions that they gave a shit. All that other stuff was just fluff trying to make me feel comfortable with them being there to get me to open up and, and tell them something that could potentially put me in jail with the J6ers. So, so are you a member of the Catholic Church? I mean, that's that's one of the that's one of the new well, hindsight. I should have said no. If I was, I'd have had an FBI badge on. That's, that's right. Oh, I mean, it's just I don't, boom, what they list as actually a threat these days is just to me. That's incredible. Sorry. Hold on one second here. I, it, what they classify as a threat. I cannot believe. I mean, it's like anybody and everybody who's anywhere to the right of the spectrum is now a threat. And well, they've got a bill that they're trying to pass now. That's that's going through the, the chambers. Uh, I forget the number of it where they're trying to regulate or eliminate or regulate how many people can train together a, in a firearms session to where if more than two or three people are together with the express purpose of training in firearms, 
that 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 would be deemed as an act of domestic domestic violence, domestic terrorism, and they could be held accountable for that for nothing more than going to a concealed carry class. Uh, it could be manipulated into something far far worse, yeah. which is just absolutely mind numbing to me. Which so uh, since how we're on the topic of firearms, you know, sure. before we came on camera today, I got. I got to see a little, a couple of pieces of the personal collection. So I know that you're a firearms enthusiast. I was yeah. on your website. I seen that you got the A minus rating from uh, Buckeye Firearms. I looked on their website. I couldn't see why you got the A minus rating, but I seen that there was an A minus rating, which is better than not an A. But no, no, that, an that's a, a minus. It's actually huh? A rated. Oh, was it? That, Maybe it was a just a dash. That's a high. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I will I make sure that a, that minus, a, a minus. You're still not a gun grabber, right? No, I am not. Um, and, and and let me address that. You mentioned earlier, um, how do you address some of this from the criminal element side? And almost 10 years ago, we were working on an issue. And a friend of mine who is a state rep, a state representative, sorry. And he had mentioned going on a tour in the inner city. And in that tour, he came across a shotgun that was stuck between what was basically two cement block walls of an old building. And everybody kind of looked at it and like, oh, what, what do we do? Nobody wanted to touch it. And he's like, look, I'm not leaving this here. So he picked it up, put it in the trunk of his car, drove it down to District 4 and said, hey, there's a shotgun in the back of my trunk. We found it out there. Don't know what to do. And they're like, oh, not a problem. And he said, you know, even as a state rep with a well-known family, he was concerned about it. And so when you're dealing with communities that have low levels of trust, especially with police departments, there needs to be another mechanism in there. And so one of the things we looked at was there's, and this kind of goes to that aspect of when you talk about people being able to go, okay, the government passed a law. Well, we're going to move around that real fast. Here's how we do it. The criminal element does that as well. And they do it when it comes to, um, if, if you are arrested with a gun on you, what happens? Now you get charged accordingly. If you're not allowed to have that gun, you're going to be charged with weapons under disability. Exactly. So does the criminal element know that? Absolutely. Oh, for sure. They know they're not allowed to have those blasters, but that's not going to stop them from getting them. It doesn't stop them from getting them, but what it does, they'll actually hide them around the community. Um, so right, I've heard about this before. It's called community guns. Correct. So community guns are out there and in low trust communities, they don't call the police and go, Hey, I just found a 357 loaded sitting in the mailbox, which is one of the things we found and came across. They actually, we, so we talked to the police, talked to the ATF, talked to the sheriff and, and said, we'd like to make some sort of relief valve in the community to get these criminal element guns out. Um, originally we used the term buyback and it was like, I had a, one of my uh, good friends said, did you own it in the first place? It's like, no. Well then it's not a buyback. Oh, that's true. Okay. So we changed the name to community gun turn in and we do it as a no questions asked uh, a friend of mine's African-American. So we sat down with channel nine and said, you know, bluntly put, I'm, you know, white Republican suburbanite. He's black Democrat urbanite and a bullet doesn't care. So, yeah, I read the article. I read a news article about this from uh, from the Mallory fella. Yes. Not a not a not a big fan of uh, the verbiage that that fella used to describe <sighs> his feelings on how he supports the Second Amendment. Yeah, he's now he also is a concealed carry guy, too, at this point. <laughs> So I'll, share, I'll out him that way. But yeah, no, he's, I can't control his language. I'll put it that way. <laughs> um, but one of the things we looked at was how do we do this? So we do these street rescue events and we have had 18 different um, NRA pro gun groups come out and say, you know, Chicago, New Jersey, Detroit, stop doing what you're doing. Do it this way. And we use private funds and we open up, we work with a church. And a local church say, this is not a gotcha. Um, if you have something that you know is hidden in your community that you do not want, that you want to get it out of there, bring it in, no questions asked. 
and we bring the, we have people bring them in. We've had over a hundred guns turned in. About a third of them are loaded when they come in. So safety is our first priority. When they come in, um, we clear them, check them. We, some people take gift cards, some don't. Some people are just like, thank you for letting me get this out of the community. I don't know anything more about it. Here it is. Um, I have a very nice black powder rifle that came in that way of all things, you know. Um, but what we do is we actually get these in, clear them, check to see if they're stolen. If they're stolen, they go back to the rightful owner. If they are, um, if their serial numbers are scratched off and I mean, literally gone completely. Right. If they deface the firearm, that firearm has to be destroyed. That has to be destroyed. Now we get the parts off from it first that we can, but that receiver itself has to be destroyed. Then ones that are not a lot of, a lot of, not a demand, lot of, not a lot of demand for heart high points, park kits. <laughs> actually a lot of Ravens and pocket pistols, things like that. Um, I was actually going to bring that up because the, the gun store that I work at actually could use parts guns. So next time you do this, you know, if you get a pile of Ravens and Jimenez's and oh, yeah. you know, those crap guns, Yep. Go ahead and let me know when you've got them stripped of their parts because uh, we've got a place where they can go back into working guns. I, I, I will I will do that. That's exactly what we do is put them back into working guns. And then actually there's a FFL that sells them back publicly. Well, I, let, let's rephrase this because we're talking about Jimenez's and high points and it, it, <laughs> they kind of work. All right. They're, they're single shot semi-automatic handguns. Because even on their best day, you're not going to get more than two or three shots off out of the gun. <laughs> that, that is more than a fair point at this point. Um, we have gotten in shotguns and some rifles and some other things that people, you know, have hit around. Um, but it's been it's been interesting. Again, criminal element gun. We try to make a point. We do. We offer coupons and gift certificates for people who want to do any kind of training, um, encourage training and safety. But that's what we do with them. Um, again. Well, we, we just, don't in this live stream, just in this live stream, you found two new homes for your parts. Calvin Actually, Robinson works at a gun store out in Adams County. He said that they're constantly in need of parts as well. So um, you may have just found a way of relieving yourself of a bunch of those parts. Well, I'll tell you, a lot of them are already gone because they get sold off pretty quick. But I will, right. if you don't mind catching up with me afterwards, Paul, and get me connected up with them, I'll make sure we get connected up around that piece of it because that's that's exactly it. So it's... I, I am well, not I'm a, not a fan not of a the idea. Of the I can tell you that. <laughs> I'm not a fan of the concept of gun buybacks. That's why I'm glad that you guys uh, remarketed it as something else because I just don't like the term gun buyback. Exactly. You know, I, you, I, I'm sure that you've read all the statistics and the articles. You know, buybacks. Even what you're doing doesn't necessarily remove crime from the area, yep. um, but. I, you know, as far when it goes to the, the low trust communities, you know, the, the, the pre predominantly Latino African-American communities that have very low trust in police, I can, I can see maybe there being a viable way of getting rid of those community guns. You know, if, if you're a mom, if you're a dad, if you're a grandpa, an aunt, an uncle, and you, you're old enough to realize the jackassery going on in your community and you actually know where there's a firearm at that you could remove and keep maybe not even to, to keep somebody from getting shot. But let's keep that young fella from catching a felony. Let's keep that group of boys that put that gun there that aren't really killers yet. They're, they don't want to be killers. They just want to be accepted. They want to be their little gangbanger hard asses and be accepted. It's not maybe not always the case, but in a lot of these situations, I would imagine that they just want to be cool. Mm -hmm. We see the videos coming from the inner city kids out of Chicago where 15 or 20 of them get together and they're all pointing their guns around and using terrible muzzle discipline and no trigger control. Yeah. And, oh, man, it just makes your butt yeah. pucker watching the video waiting for someone to get popped right in front exactly. of you. But. If we could save one of them kids, I, maybe, I don't know, it, it might be worth the effort. You know, I mean, if you still have hope for humanity, and I think that uh, Charles still has hope for humanity, that, you know, yeah. I guess I'm just not a big fan of it because I don't really feel like it does any any real positive impact. But who am I to judge? Like I said, we might not see eye to eye on every single topic, but I, I don't think what you're doing is out there to try to rob grandma out of her World War II relic. Oh. Um you know, and hopefully actually, those guns are spared. 
from the and, crusher? Well, it, and that's exactly right. And actually, I had um, Cincinnati police officer, I won't say his name, preserve his badge number and such, but he, he pulled me aside one day and he said, we actually tried to get this lady who had two old Lugers in fantastic shape to call you guys. And she insisted on giving them to us. And I'm like, oh, you know, it's like the class. And literally, her uncle had brought them back from World War II. Well, see, here in Brown <laughs> County, the the county I live in here in Southern Ohio, we have a unique thing that happens out here with our sheriff's department. I don't know. I call it unique because I've never really heard of any other sheriff's department around the country that does this. But as over the course of time, as the sheriff's department retrieves guns off of the street, you know, they pull somebody over, they've got drugs or whatever in the car, you know, they seize the gun. Part of the deal to get released is you forfeit the gun. That's a very common thing in many, many places is that we'll, we'll drop the charge if you're willing to just, you know, surrender the gun. Mm -hmm. We'll go ahead and let whatever you did go. But anyway, over the course of a year's time, the sheriff's department accumulates a shit ton of firearms. Yep. And as the cases that are associated with said guns are wrapped up and over with, they don't need those guns anymore. They've been surrendered. But in, in lieu of destroying said firearms, they hold on to them until they have a significant amount of them. And then they do a private auction amongst the local FFLs. There's like four FFLs in Brown County that will get the opportunity to go in and make bids on those guns and then bring them back and put them back out on the street. That's like, yeah. that's, a, that's an interesting way thing you guys have got going on there, you know, because yeah. I kind of was under the impression that if those guns were surrendered, that they were supposed to be destroyed. Now, and, and that really comes down to each area and community on what their determination is. In Cincinnati, they destroy them. So we, we'd rather give them the opportunity to turn them into us and we can rescue them from the street as well. So I like what you're doing there. That's the, that's a great way of saving them. And again, provides a nice. Relief. Typically what they did is the, typically what they're bringing in though, is the same thing that you had in that photo of, in the article of you holding a brief briefcase full of $25 yep. guns. Yep. You know, that's typically what they get in. You you don't see occasionally, you know, I mean, because I've got to see the list of the guns that were in for auction. I mean, occasionally they do get a few nicer pieces in, mm -hmm. but for the most part, it's very low end, 22 revolvers, 25 ACPs, high points, Jennings, Lorisons, Ravenezes. Yep. Um, you know, every now and then you might see a Smith and Wesson or something like that come get mixed in with the mix, but you, you don't really see a whole lot of Colts or Staccatos or, you know, any, any of the high end stuff you don't nope. really see in there very often. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure somebody saves that from the auction table. Well, and, and, and we don't see those come in through street rescue because that's not the, the inexpensive one that they're going to hide around that is the potentially disposable one. So, yeah. All yeah. right, let's uh, let's jump into another question here. How's that sound? Sure. Uh, bu -bu 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 I feel, I'm, I'm feeling like the, a lot of what you're talking about, the community protecting our kids, mm -hmm. this seems to be a, a lot about what you've got going on. And, that, and it's an admirable thing. What do your, what are your thoughts on the gender dysphoria and how it's impacting our kids and our communities. I mean, you're, you're a major concern are about are the, are the communities and the kids Absolutely. and this gender dysphoria thing going on in our society right now seems to be crippling a lot of people. What are your thoughts on that? And is, is there anything that you think you could do if you were congressman to, to try to correct these problems? So, let me let me address it from the backside first. On a congressional level, I think a lot of this should stay at the state level, and I, and I mean that. Uh, too often, well, I'm in Congress, so I'm going to fix this. A lot of these things need to be state level and be addressed at the state. So let's just start there. Having said that, I am not for. Um, okay, again, I mentioned earlier, I have a 15 year old female. She should not have a young man in her locker room at all. Period. That 15-year-old, by the way, cannot get a tan, cannot get a tattoo, cannot do a variety of things, including vape or whatever, smoke, 
drink, but yet we're suddenly going to go, oh, you want to go get some change that's going to mutilate your body and permanently change you for the rest of your life. Okay, we can do that. It just it makes no sense whatsoever. But and, don't smoke a cigarette. Oh, heaven forbid. But, you know, suddenly you can make life-altering decisions, and we're going to accept a six-year-old's decision on that, a seven-year-old's decision on it. Who do you think told him that in the first place? Yeah, I mean, it, just, oh, it was most definitely an adult. You know, that that's the stuff that drives me crazy. It's like, and again, the feels are more important than the logic. Okay, let's let's be real simple. You can't make those kind of decisions until you're 18. We've got a doctor here in Ohio who's working on 16 year olds and 15 year olds and doing double mastectomies. There's no reason for that. That should not be allowed until at least 18. And here's the interesting thing. When I was growing up, it would have been criminal. That's I agree. And I think the state should take action to make sure that that's the case on a. um no, no, I'm, I'm with you on that, Paul. <laughs> I just, oh, I just right so on. frustrating. And, and the the psychology of it, though, is interesting, too, because over, well, first of all, when we start seeing this dysphoria pop up, guess what? Suddenly there's two, three, four others all have dysphoria all at once because it's the in thing to do. And it's trendy so, now. Psychologists have said this is this is not right that this means that there's not something actually hormonal. This is not actually something real. This is just something that's occurring. So we know that that is not legitimate. Now, once we get past that, now we need to go, okay, even if we took the original ones who had the dysphoria that said something's not right, I feel funky. Okay, guess what? Everybody going through their teen years feels funky at some point. Now, by the time you get to your 18 and your 20, most of those people have kind of gone, huh, my brain's grown. My hormones have settled down a little bit. <sighs> yep, I really am this. And they are exactly as they were born. And that is overwhelmingly the truth. Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly the truth. We're talking over 80. I've seen numbers as high as 90, 95%, with the other 10% still in indecision. They're not saying I'm making a decision. They're saying I'm still not decided. So this is that's at the time they're 18 to 20. So letting children move forward with mutilating themselves when we've had the logic and the reason to say, okay, you can't smoke till you're at least 18. You can't do this. You can't do, you can't go to the tanning salon for Pete's sake, but we'll let you mutilate yourself. That's crazy. Hell in Ohio, you can't buy a pack of cigarettes until you're 21. That, you know, no, it's wild. It's <sighs> wild. You know, when that, when that was all being passed, man, I sit back and I scratched my head. Like I cannot <laughs> believe that they're going to, to, why do these folks think that they have the right to tell an 18 year old man or woman that's to be held accountable for their actions on every level of, um, uh, that, that you can measure by, right? but you're still going to tell them that they can't go out and buy a vape. What's the, why are you guys such a hard on with vapes is big tobacco. This is why they don't like lobbyists because they know big tobacco lobbied to get the vaping industry crushed. Yep. It, they know about the lobbyist for the NRA and they know about the lobbyist for the anti-gunners and they know about the lobbyist for big oil and they know about the lobbyist for big pharma. They don't know about the lobbyist for big syrup and big poultry, but you know, I mean, it still exists. It's still there. They're there. They're still there. And I would suggest to you this, there's also the lobbying for the cannabis side of things. Absolutely. And, and you know, you know, I love to enjoy my, my herbal pleasantries. So I'm not even like the first time in 2003 when legalization of marijuana came up in Ohio, I voted no on it. And I'm a huge advocate for freedom of being able to decide for yourself. Do I want to do this or do I not want to do this? Am I causing harm to others by my actions of doing this? No, no, and no. So cool. I'm going to do this. Right. Right. Um, I, I, like know, I, I like that. I like that libertarian situation. streak. But, and uh, but I didn't like the way the bill was written. The bill was written to create a monopoly by default. And that's not what I'm into. I mean, if we're going to legalize this and, and cash in on the cash cow, it has to be fair across the board for everybody. Everybody should be able to get a little nibble of this and not be boxed out just because they weren't a part of the group of people that created the legislation. Yeah, 
Absolutely. I, I think you're exactly right on that. The, the competition side of it, the monopoly side, and, and let's face it, even on the medical marijuana side, we still have monopoly here now in Ohio. Right. And well, and that's one of the right. things that made me happy with uh, Mike DeWine signing the, the, the recreational marijuana was that, you know, overall, it should crush any kind of illegal activities in it. I mean, if it's done with any way, anything that I would do with it, Mm -hmm. it'll drive the value of marijuana down so low that criminal enterprise won't have any use for it. Well, and, and I think that's why you're seeing criminal elements or criminal enterprises shift from, they, they, they started getting out of some of the cocaine. They found that that wasn't nearly as much. They shifted to pot for quite a while. And then they've, as pots become more legal in different areas, the value of it's dropped. Although when the government goes through and taxes it to such a degree that it creates a black market for it, guess what? You still have the illegal activity going. So that didn't help. But that's why you're seeing the fentanyl side. You're going to see some more of these designer type drugs coming through because there are pharmacy grade areas around the world that are going to produce this stuff and bring it here. Um, and, and that's one. And, and I'll say this. I think that's a conversation on the opioid side that we can have with China. And again, being a little bit of a student of history on this piece of it, China suffered under opioids. They had their opioid opium wars. They know how devastating it is. We need to have a president who's strong enough to come to them and talk about it from that perspective and get them involved and get their support on that level. That's when you can actually start to make changes. So uh, we was just talking about that marijuana thing. You know, uh, if if it was to come up, be a topic of discussion, where would you fall on the side of uh, decriminalizing or reclassifying marijuana on on the the federal charts? So there's a couple pieces to that. So one is there is nobody in the world as a scientist that can say with a straight face that marijuana is on the same same stage as an opioid. Right. It's, I mean, it's, it's just not. silly that it's classified the same anyway. Correct. So that needs to be corrected and that needs to be readdressed. So once that change comes through, I'm not going to pretend to know what the actual change should be at this point, but it does need to come off of narcotics. Now, from there, we I also. Mean, in my opinion, it should be treated just like anything else that's a prescribed. I mean, if you got a prescription for it, it's no brainer. I mean, and honestly, I, I don't even think it should be regulated that much. Just fucking take it off the books altogether. Well, and, and see, here's the thing. Because of how it's being treated as a narcotic, now we create a banking system that's a side banking system. And what happens is now you've forced all this finances underground. You're funding, you know, you, if you don't know where the money's going, it's going to bad elements. So help bring that money up in. And that doesn't mean I am for any kind of digital dollar. Don't get me wrong there. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, because literally the way that it sits right now, because of the, the FDIC regulations, you've got all of your legal operating dispensaries that have nothing to do with $250,000 a day in, in cash being revenued. You know, I mean, there's literally storage units in California and Colorado that are nothing but housing for cash because there's nothing they can't take it to the bank. You can't even really spend it. You can't show up at the real estate agent with two point five million dollars cash money and buy a house. Yeah. It just they no, you, we we can't do that. Right, and, and bring somebody's going to ask questions. Well, okay, and as soon as somebody finds out you're moving that kind of money, now we've got more criminal side of things. So uh, that, those are kinds of things that are really troubling. We need to be able to bring it back into the financial system and allow it to move forward. That helps and cut out. It boils money. down to getting back a little bit of freedom. You know, anything that will put freedom and the ability to make the choices back in my hands, I tend to stand for that. You know, if it's going to put more freedom into my ability to decide for myself, you know, I was led to believe when I was growing up that when I became a man, I'd be able to make my choices for myself. Mama said yeah. that I'd be able to decide for myself what I wanted to do with my life. And it just it seems well, ever growingly like that. That's just not really the truth. You know, as long as it doesn't interfere with this, you're all right. <laughs> well, I mean, as long as mama's OK, the wife's OK with that's it, right. too. But, right. I mean, in all reality, I mean, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to go out and smoke a joint. You know, I get 
that there's people out there that would say, oh, well, there's going to be this problem and there's going to be that problem. Well, that's why we address those problems when they come up. We, we don't premeditate, premeditatively fight crime. The crime has to happen and then you bust them for it. The, the mere act, if, if a fellow wants to come home from a hard day's work and spark up a doobie in his, in his living room and he's not beating his wife or abusing his kids, what's the problem? Oh, well, he had a bag of marijuana in his pocket on the highway. Was he high? If he was high, we can address that. That That's addressable. You probably shouldn't be smoking a bunch of dope getting behind the wheel of your car. I'll agree with that. You know, that's that's common sense. We have sense ways reason. to figure that out. We have ways to figure that out, ways to address that. Mm -hmm. that, that. Again, back to your point. Are you harming somebody else or is this a freedom for yourself? And that's that's the core principle that's involved here. So, right. As I, long as you're not causing damage to property or harm to another, what's the problem? Correct. correct. So, yep. Let's see here. Um, are you familiar with the, the statement that was made recently by in the press release from our Butler County Sheriff here in Southern Ohio? He made a press release about training the in our not, not army. But he was made a statement about training local police or local citizens into being their own first responders because he simply doesn't have the resources available to ensure the safety for his entire community. Was that in context of when he returned from the um, Washington with the sheriffs? OK, yes. I, I know he because he made a comment about about that saying not. And, and if you haven't seen that video, I'd recommend it, which is. He made the comment about all the lights that were flashing before 9-11, not that we want to go into that issue, but the chatter that was going on at the time, those lights are all like literally on bright right now. And it's right. not a question of if something's going to happen. It's just a question of when and where. Right. And, and, you know, look, if you're not, I'm not saying I'm a full on prepper, but if you're not prepared and taking care of your family, you have not done Honestly, you haven't done right by from a biblical perspective, a human perspective, a man perspective, because you should be able to take care of yourself. Um, let's face it. When seconds count. The government's minutes away. Unless you live in Brown County and then they could be as far out as 45 minutes to an hour right now in Brown County, Ohio. I've got two deputies rolling around for the entire county. Oh, I got two deputies on duty for my entire county right now. It's absolutely mind-blowing how yeah. understaffed our local sheriff's department is. They're underfunded, they're understaffed, they're under-equipped, they're under-trained, they're grossly under-trained. I mean, I can't even, you know, people want to talk about the, the disconnect between police and, and citizens. And I, I'm going to go back to where I've always been on this. This is going to fall down to training, hiring practices and training. You know, when you're doing diversity hires and, and, and hiring people just because you need to fill a number, not because they're qualified at all. In fact, they're grossly unqualified. But because you have to hire X amount of women or X amount of this color of people, you're putting not only those people in harm's way, but you're doing a disjustice to the community because you're creating opportunities for mistakes to be made. And then instead of owning your mistakes, you freaking cover it up and you try to hide it as much as you can until the public has all of the information and you can't hide it anymore. And then you're just like, oh, OK, we uh, messed you, up. you mean we'll you're going to you're really going to open that door, Paul, that door that blew I off. The line? I'm sorry. I oh, was that. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what it was. It's the same thing that that door flew off the plane because of exactly that kind of issue. Let's focus on, you know, it, rather than and I still go back to this. I sat down on these issues. Martin Luther King Jr.'s comment. Let's talk about the quality and the character, not the color of the skin. And, and we have completely inverted his idea, which is, look. If your quality, if your character, that that's what we care about. You hire character. You can train everything else. Right. So, yeah. Well, and there needs to be higher standards of training in our law enforcement today. I mean, yep. you know, Butler County and just like Brown County or any other county, you know, the, the officers are not required by the state of Ohio. OPATA certifications are not strenuous enough. These... The, the, the certifications are not strenuous enough to begin with. And then you compile that with tight budgets, 
that doesn't allow the departments a budget to be able to pay for additional training for their officers. Like in Brown County, Ohio, our deputies have their own personal duty rifles in their cars because there's no budget to buy duty rifles for the department. All right. So they're carrying their own personal weapons in their car for this. All right. Uh, there's no money available for them to go get follow-up training. You know, we have 20, 25 schools in Brown County, and there's no SWAT team available in Brown County. If there was a public shooting, if there was a mass shooting at one of our schools or one of our after-curricular events, the sheriff's department, grossly understaffed, grossly underarmed, would have to rely on local police departments to create the perimeter around this facility and stand there and wait for SWAT to come in because none of our guys have the stuff that they need to be able to go in and effectively do this. Now, I know because I know the men and women of our police departments, they wouldn't just stand there. They would go and they would get the ever-loving shit shot out of them because they don't have the funding. They don't have the ability to create training days where school's out of session and you get all of the sheriffs and you get a volunteer from every police department throughout the county. And this weekend, we're going to focus on this school and we're going to learn that school inside and out. And we're going to have a blueprint that the sheriff's department has, the Claremont County Sheriff's Department has, the Highway Patrol has. Every police department in the county should have an index of the, the maps and blueprints of every school in the county and they should be able to know them. And the next weekend, we're going to go to another school and we're going to do the same thing because not all of our schools are unified in the floor plans because yep. they were built at different times. You know, you get into the wealthier communities, they got five or six new schools all at once. Those buildings are all pretty much the same style. Our buildings out here are all different, would require multiple training days, but there's no budget available to pay anybody to do that. So it doesn't happen. Well, but but there's there's two issues there, really. One is, especially when it comes to schools, there's programs like Faster and other things that are out there that, look, we've got teachers who are skilled, who are trained, who are very qualified and capable of being able to protect themselves and defend students. Let them. That's first and foremost. Now, again, that is a state issue, not a federal issue per se. It may come up at a federal level. We'll see. But that should be something. And no guns in school zones. Okay, that's one. Again, that's a federal rule that needs to be revoked as well. It but the does. Other side is training. When it comes to training, I was as a council member, I was in charge. I was chairman of finance, and that was one thing I pulled pulled our chief aside and I said, "Okay, how much training are you guys doing? How much do you want to do? Okay, how much does that cost? Let's figure out that becomes one of the top issues in the budget to make sure that they're trained well. Because if they're trained well, not only are my citizens protected better, my officers are protected better because." If they're doing the right things and they're more confident, they don't have to be cocky. They don't have to. Well, I, I think it's and you move past that. Now they know what they're supposed to do. You don't get into. I, I love watching. This is my guilty pleasure is watching some of those auditor videos online. I, I enjoy those a great deal. Doing it correctly. But from doing it correctly, you're 100 percent right. Don't be. You've got to be educated. Don't don't get yourself in a position where you made yourself look like an idiot. Correct. And, and do that. And we can fund that and make sure it's a priority. And that's that's one of the key pieces from a from a policing perspective, from a finance perspective on council member level. That's what I it was one of the key things like, OK, here's what you need. OK, we'll work on the other pieces of budget. But this locks in because we are not we are not changing off that. It's mind numbing to me, too, because, I mean, how many lawsuits do you have to pay out before you could have just covered before you covered proper training? Exactly. You exactly. Know, why are we putting the cart ahead of the horse? Train these people properly to where they make fewer mistakes. You have less millions of dollars of lawsuits being paid out, which allows you to have a bigger budget to do other things with. It, and, it's, it's a one plus one equals two kind of thing, not a one plus one equals five. But I, I will offer this. I'd say it's a one plus one equals three in that you also build trust in your community. And that's the side benefit that in these, those low trust communities we talked about have lost that because somebody's coming in, zipping in, zipping out. They don't have the confidence. They don't have the relationship time. They don't build. That is not how you want policing to be done. And you want to be able to support those officers and make sure that they have the tools that they need. And in some cases, that means, guess what? They've got old defensive weaponry or defensive body armor that, guess what? With heat, sweat, all that, guess what? They break down. 
you better be getting mm -hmm. new ones. And what killed me was they were like, okay, well, we're going to see if some of the other departments might want these. I'm like, if they're not good enough for us, why are we going to get there? Like, well, they don't even have any. I'm like, oh, okay. Donate them. Let's see what we can do. We do not need to, you know, so yeah. Well, we're getting close to being about where I wanted to be on the clock. Okay. we got about 15 minutes left to go. And one thing that I wanted to bring up, um, and this may be outside of your purview, but I'm pretty certain that as a congressman or at the very least a person running for Congress, mm -hmm. um, you're going to be finding yourself rubbing elbows with a lot of different law enforcement personnel, you know, right. different chiefs, different sheriffs, so on and so forth. There's something that has came to my attention here over the last couple of months that, that I find to be very, very disturbing. This started out when I, I started working down here at the gun store. And uh, there was a Greenup County Sheriff was buying ammunition for his department. You know, he was using his budget to buy ammunition. Mm -hmm. And uh, instead of putting the ammunition into the Sheriff's Department for the officers, he ended up embezzling that ammunition, stole it, took it home with the intent of selling it. Uh, it was, you know, several hundred thousand dollars worth of ammunition. That am he ended up getting caught. The, the once the court case was all said and done, the gun store that I work for ended up winning the having the winning bid to be able to buy said ammunition once it was uh, cleared from the court proceedings as evidence. When that ammunition came in, we got to talking and come to find out something very similar had happened here in Brown County, but that person had got away with it. He didn't get caught. Uh, and then I found out that there's another police department here in Brown County that has been doing the exact same thing. They came into the gun store trying to sell 100,000 rounds of 556 five, tracer ammunition. And I looked at the owner after he left and said, what in the world would a local police department need that much fucking tracer ammo for? Why would they need tracer ammo for any reason at all? You don't train with tracer ammo, not a local law enforcement, maybe military, but it just seemed like a really odd purchase for that department to have made and then showed up at the local gun store trying to sell said ammunition. Was that money truly going back into the coffers or did this guy just embezzle a shitload of ammo from the police department and is trying to pocket the proceeds off of it? As a citizen, that concerns the ever loving crap out of me because, you know, my tax dollars are valuable to me. I would like to keep them in my pocket not see them being embezzled out of the police department, especially as my business donates a lot of money to local law enforcement because, you know, cops are cool. You know, how about no ticket today? You know, $10,000 today donation, no ticket. It doesn't never work. I still get the ticket, but I do a lot. I do a lot of work to help the local law enforcement out around here. And to find out that that kind of thing is going on is very disturbing. It would be something I would love to see shared around the the talking circles to let these people know that if that this is getting out people are finding out about this you know this is something that if you're a part of this if you if this kind of shenanigans is going on you should probably look into it and put the put the kibosh to it because words out the cat's out of the bag now people know that this is going on and like myself I'm personally going to take the lead on this and push like there's no end to make sure that everybody under the sun knows to, to keep an eye on this in their local police departments, because it's absolutely criminal. They need to be held accountable for it. And it's just another thing that cre creates more distrust between the citizenry and law enforcement. So I understand as a congressman, you're, you're kind of limited in what different purviews you have to be able to act in, but you're going to know people. You're going to be talking to people. You can get the word out. So, so let me, let me bounce this off you. And this is, again, we did this in Deer Park. I've seen this done. And you might remember Treasurer Mandel, um, when Josh Mandel, when he was treasurer, put in place the open checkbook process. And again, Sunshine is a great disinfectant. And so Sunshine Law, when you consider open books and open checkbooks, so that local municipalities can put their local, can put their checkbooks online. What that does is it allows everybody to look at it. Now, Let's face it. You and I might know the difference between a three-stage trigger and a four-stage trigger. Outside of us, outside of a smaller group of people, people go, okay, 
And if I say, oh, I need, I need to get that four stage trigger and I need to make sure it's a Timney or a this or a that. Oh, well, okay. If that's what the expert's saying, I guess we need that. Versus three other experts on the outside are like, he's got a Ruger 1022. Why is he buying that? So he doesn't need that. You know, that's where an open checkbook process allows for that public participation. It puts sunshine on all those expenses and what's really going on with the money. That is one of the most, transparency is absolutely essential in government. And that is, that's how I can sum it up to say that's that's the key piece to it. And I encourage people at the, I, I, I speak at a number of Tea Party events and things, and transparency is one of the key pieces. You want to make sure your government is transparent. And that means sunshine laws, open checkbooks, and things like that. That's how you make sure you're keeping your government accountable. Oh, yeah. All right, Charles. Well, I had a great time sitting here with you today. I hope that uh, we was able to make an impact on the voters here in the area. Once the videos, uh, once we're done with this, I'll get out and share it around on my social medias and make sure that we get a pretty good audience. Typically, my videos are hitting between, you know, 2,500 and 6,000 people uh, over the course of a few weeks. So, I mean, we're going to have a little bit of a reach. It won't be huge, but if we get one more voter to swing your way, if we can get one cat out there to throw a check your way to help with the campaign cost, uh, you know, I guess it would be worth it, right? Well, I, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm not a millionaire running in this race. I have, uh, I've done well in my life and I appreciate the opportunity to participate. Um, but making sure that people are informed is really the most important thing. March 19th is coming up in about 30 days. I encourage people to get out and vote. Um, I'm not, it's not Chicago, so don't vote early, vote often, but you can vote early. Right on. All right, guys. Well, um, we've got about seven or so minutes left. If there's anybody in the live chat that would like to ask any questions, let's go ahead and get that party started. And if I don't see some questions popping up real quick, we'll go ahead and just call it a day and, and get on because I've actually got another live stream to do tonight at 1030 is my uh, my weekly show with uh, Dear Sarge. So, yeah. Can I show a toy while we're, we're, we're waiting for a second? Yeah. Yeah. This is Rumble. It's not YouTube. We don't have hardly. Oh, there's almost no restrictions here. This, this is my little toy. This is the. Nice. So I, have, I have this on my uh, little Strybog. I love it. A little shake awake with a red dot. And of course, this is one of those things that, okay, yes, technically it's classified as a silencer. And yes, it's it's all legal. I'm not putting this up here. It's not illegal. Don't get me wrong. Um, it really is a suppressor, folks. Let's call it that because that's really what it is. Although in the in the language of the law, it's classified as a silencer. And let's make those available for everyone to buy over the counter. Because that is number one for hearing protection. Um, when you can take a good twenty you know, decibels off, I, I would even meet. I would even meet the left halfway on this and say, put it on a forty-four seventy-three. Okay. Just, I would even meet halfway with that and say, you know what? Get rid of the tax stamp. No wait. I want to buy it right now. I've got the money. If I can pass a background check, give it to me. It, I would way. prefer it your way. Just let right. me pick it up off the shelf and walk out with it. But yep. again, back to being in a real, reasonable and yep. rational world, compromises have to be made to get enough people on board to get these things passed through the legislature. So, you know, if we said, hey, my people have all agreed, we'll, we'll do a 4473. Let's get this thing pushed on through. That, I think that would be a very fair compromise right. because I've already got 50 4473s on file anyway. <laughs> What's the fucking do? That's it. Well, and, and those things should get destroyed as well, but that's a different issue. But, the, you know, they that, don't. And that is a problem. They don't. You know, they don't. Yep. And, and that's, yeah. that's part of the problem. Well, and, and unless unless the gun store owner was an exceptional guns, uh, exceptional patriot, and they had a terrible fire right at the same time that they closed. That's just that would be so terrible. Oh, darn. It, it would be terrible, especially the building didn't even have electricity that in it that they stored the forms in. It's the craziest right. thing ever. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So, All right. Uh, let's let's see. That. I got I got a question over here. Ask about Derek Mayers. I don't even know who that is. So Mayers Myers. Yeah, there's 10 other 10 other people in the race. Uh, Derek Myers. Okay, that's a, one of the other, yeah, he's one of the other candidates up from Chillicothe. Okay. Claims to be he's he's a reporter. He's been a reporter. I should say claims to be he's 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 a reporter. 
So right on. Awesome. Uh, there's a bunch of people running in, in in this particular race. Like my wife happens to work for Tim O'Hare. Yep. Right. I got a Tim O'Hare sign out front. You know, I mean, yep. that doesn't necessarily mean that's who I'm voting for, but she works for Tim O'Hare. She plans on voting for Tim O'Hare. I don't know enough about Tim O'Hare to say whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. You know, I know that he's been a, what I know about Tim is that he's been a fairly successful guy that built himself from the ground up. But I can also say the same thing about you. And I can say the same thing about David Taylor. And there's a handful of other guys that are all independently. I wouldn't, I don't think it's fair to say wealthy. That might be overreaching a tad, but they've done okay for themselves. You know, they're, they're financially secure. And I think any at this point, I'm on the fence of saying that any of you guys would be a viable candidate. And that's why I wanted to have Charles come on here to hear it from the horse's mouth, what his thoughts on different topics were to give him a chance to be heard. And, you know, we'll go from there. If any of the other candidates would like to have the same opportunity that Charles has had, I'd be more than open to bringing them on and giving them the same opportunity for me to embarrass them as I did Charles. That's great. No, I, I think it's great. Tim's a great guy. There's a lot of, there's a number of us that get along great. We see each other all the time on the, out on the, out on the trail and track around. So it, it's a good group. Of Is folks. that code for golf course? Yeah, that's it. That's it. well, when you're on the campaign trail and running around all over the place, you run into each other and you know, you sit there and watch it, look at it like, why are they saying that's different? Okay. You know, and kind of chatting the sidelines while you're waiting. So Good folks. I, I, Tim's got a great lot right. of what is uh, what is your website so people can go and check you out and find out even more about you? Sure. Tasselforcongress.com is my website. That's T A S S E L L for Congress.com. And I'm also All on right. Facebook as well. So happy to come either way. All right. And you guys, if you anybody in the live stream that if, that if you have a question, hit him up on Facebook. <laughs> He's going to answer your question or you're going to annoy the living shit out of him until he does. Right. Sure. I mean, here. that's what we do to anybody else that's running for an office or has an office is that we just blow them up with emails until they either answer us or they just hire somebody else to delete the emails for them. So <laughs> hey, Paul, to that point, if you want to get an elected official, well, two things, one, an elected official is never as impressing as impressive, impressionable as when they're running for office. And the best way to make sure you get their response is make sure you've got a constituent reaching out to them. So as long as they know that that's somebody who's living in their district, they are much more likely to respond. So my that's my grassroots lobbying. Sorry. That's the training I give. Those are a couple of key factors. Yeah, that lobbying thing has got a bad, <laughs> bad taboo on it over the last 20 years or so. It, All right, know, Charles, uh, I'm going to put you backstage. We're going to wrap this up. We'll chat for a couple of minutes and then I'll let you go. So uh, backstage with you. All right, guys. So I hope you enjoyed the show today. You've got an opportunity to meet the man, uh, to hear how he feels about a number of different topics. Now, again, I'm not here to tell you who to vote for, how to vote, how to think, what to think. It's not my place. My, my, my gig here is to just give you the opportunity to see and decide for yourself what makes sense for you. While uh, Charles may be a great guy, he may not be the guy for you. I don't know. That's up to you. But you had the opportunity to hear it directly from him. No bullshit, no adulterations, no no uh, agenda, narrative, spins, or twist. It is what it is. And that's as true as it can get. You know, so that's it, guys. I'll see you guys back on. I'll be back on at 1030 with Dear Sarge for the After Hours show. Be sure to live your lives to the fullest because anything less is an injustice to yourself and every single person around you. I totally appreciate everybody that stopped in for the live show. Be sure to check out the website at therapyrange.com. Stay free, America, if you can. It's time to shut up and shoot. Hi, here we go. 